five years ago, you could be sitting anywhere and speaking to anybody at the other side of the world. See, hear, who the thought? It's amazing. And did we think when Christian Barnard, do, do you remember Christian Barnard? I do remember those days. That was amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. news. Yeah. Little did I realize how it would change my life. <laughs> <laughs> Who uh, from your team will be at London Easel? Me. <laughs> I will be there. Uh, Chris will be there and Robert. We're all there doing different things. Are you there, Bob? <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to be, I'll be in London from Sunday through, through the following Tuesday. So right. nine days. Mostly I'm, work. Yeah, I'm there on the 22nd Wednesday. Um, I'm at a symposium, Dave Jones' symposium Thursday, and then leave on the Friday. And that's What's, what time is the symposium on Thursday? Six thirty our time. Okay. And it's then and now. All right, I've got to figure out what else is going on Thursday night. I think I have four other obligations that night, but we'll see, check it out. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> That is us actually live on Facebook now. So, okay, um, right. What the dish comes back, I will uh, just say what I was looking to say. And then, obviously, you know, you'd, uh, as usual, I'm sure they'll have a fantastic session. <laughs> yeah. They go so quickly, that's for sure. They certainly do. Mm. There we are, Bob. We're okay. live. So I would just like to welcome everybody from wherever you are in the world to our uh, question and answer webinar with today's guest medic is Dr. Robert Gish from California in the USA. And if I could just say, Dr. Gish is joining us at 7 a.m. in the morning, his time, 3 p.m. UK time. So it's absolutely fantastic that he's actually taken the time to do that. So we thank you very much, Dr. Gish. Indeed. From Colette's point of view, Colette's actually on holiday down in England. <laughs> And she's taken time out of her break to, to join this webinar so we can continue our Q&As for you. So I just wanted to say that and thank you very much both. And I'm sure you'll have a fantastic session. I will catch up with you later on. Okay, thank you, Alan. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Bob, again to um, my last session with you because that's me finishing, as I was saying, at the end of the month. Although I hope they'll see you in London next week. And um, welcome everybody. Um, we're looking forward to getting your questions. We've got some to start off with. Um, as you know, Bob has been a hepatologist some years now and he's he's been with us before and he's been excellent. So we will um start. Great start. So so somebody was on a, a, one of our sessions with Robert and say uh, she brought up the following blood test, a serum folate reading of three. The norm is 3.9 to 26. My doctor has prescribed me five milligrams of folic acid for three months. It seems a few of the others um, have been doing the same. Is this normal for PBC? Symptoms, I've been fatigued, painful limbs, brain fog, and limbs going numb. Fantastic question, Colette. I want to thank you and Alan for having me at this session. I learned so much because I think the patients are really our teachers. And yeah. this is, these cases today will be examples of that. <laughs> so folic acid, if there's a folic acid deficiency in somebody with PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, my first idea would be to evaluate that patient for sprue. It's a malabsorptive state, as you know, from gluten allergy, wheat or wheat protein allergy. It's between 7 and 15% of people with PBC have this sprue, a celiac sprue, and it can result in a malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins and potentially water-soluble vitamins like folic acid. So folic acid is great, the supplement. It has lots of protective properties to it. It sounds to me like it's the right dose, right thing to do. And the supplementation may make you feel better, but make sure your other vitamin levels are in the normal range. If not, you can take some vitamin supplements. And what would you get any comment to make about the symptoms? Fatigue, painful limbs, being cold, limbs being numb? So, you know, Colette, you're a super expert in this area, how <laughs> PBC affects your whole body. It's not a liver yeah. disease. It's a 
systemic disease. It's a body disease. It's a human disease, a humanistic uh, perspective. So I think this is probably part of the an the inflammatory state that's associated with PBC that could change the way you think, the way you feel. My solution is not taking more anti-inflammatory medications, but switch to a vegetarian type diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, of course, no alcohol. And in this diet, there's no red meat. Uh, you're maybe having olive oil, you know, unsaturated fats, at low amounts. What's your idea on diet, Colette, these days? How does that help your PBC patients? Well, diet is really, really important. At first, they say to this person, any change, and it's something like your limbs going numb. I'm not so familiar with that in relation to PPC, but any change in your symptoms, please report back to your doctor because we get other things as well as PBC. I think that's important to say that. But as for diet and PBC, I am a big anti-sugar person, anti-processed food. It's absolute rubbish. And I'm to understand that the manufacturers adjust it to increase an addiction to these products and they're not very good for you. Now you might say it's expensive to, to eat fresh food. It's not. If you get, for me, I'm telling people to buy the Pinch of Norm cookbooks and they give you a lovely 400 calorie meals if you're trying to lose weight. Nutritious meals, cheap, making bin pans of soup. It can all be done cheaply. Batch cook saves you for when you're tired. You can get something out of the freezer. But I just think sugar is one of the poisons of this planet. That's my personal opinion. I'm not so big on, on butter and things. And I do believe in olive oil, Mediterranean diet. But sugar is a, is a big no-no for me. Colette, one more idea is if somebody's deficient in folate or folic mm -hmm. acid, they need to be evaluated for B12 deficiency. Yeah. B12. Yeah. If somebody's deficient in B12, then they can have this numbness, neuropathy, nerve pain. Right. And B12 can be deficient. This is something related to PBC because PBC is mm -hmm. autoimmune. There's a condition where the lining of the stomach is attacked by the immune system called pernicious anemia. So definitely uh, my advice to people in general uh, is to get a B12 level if you have symptoms like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. My dog has pernicious anemia. <laughs> and she was very poorly to the mobile to get to the bottom of it. But she's fine now. Okay. So background, I have PBC and AIH and take 75 milligrams of azithiopine in addition to Urso. LFT is normal and last fiber scan 13. I've been classed as clinically extremely vulnerable. I've had three primary doses of the COVID vaccine and then a booster at the end of January. Last year, I had a message from the NHS, the National Health Service in the, in the UK, to say I'm eligible for a spring booster. Do I really need a fifth dose at this, at this time or might it be a mistake? There's a lot of questions in there. And yeah kind of approach them one at a time. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely super happy that the COVID vaccine is taking place and you've gotten up to four doses. The uh, fifth dose of the, uh, the vaccine is now emerging as a new recommendation. Timing of that, you can work out with your provider, but in people who are immune suppressed, that fifth dose is definitely a consideration. I'm already planning my fifth dose, but it probably won't be till the fall because I just got my fourth dose. And uh, this is something to strongly consider. The only way to get around this idea is to check antibody levels, but we're not quite sure what to do with antibody levels. We know it's low. We know it's super high. Uh, but if there is a question about that, you can uh, discuss that with your provider. The antibody levels to spike and to the nucleocapsid are commercially available through laboratories. And they can tell you a lot of information about immunity and exposure. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanna highlight, there's a difference between liver enzymes and liver function. Yeah, we, yeah. You, you and I agree, Colette, that people shouldn't just throw the word LFTs out. They should put out the word, my liver enzymes are normal, specifically ALPHOS and GGT, and my liver function tests, bilirubin and albumin are also normal. Mm -hmm. I always want to keep those separate. Colette, can we, do you think we're making progress on getting that terminology out? We are a bit, yes. We are a bit, yeah. The, yes, uh, can, we, can we talk about the azathioprine uh, question just for a moment? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in general, azathioprine is not used for just PBC. Um, this does require this overlap, which this person has described. And that mixture, the overlap is about 15%. Colette, would you agree with that 15% number? Mm, this is what I've been hearing. Okay. Uh, and then uh, you need to be monitored with azathioprine for the blood levels of the metabolites of azathioprine. So I hope this person and other people on azathioprine are getting levels assessed. So they're not too high. They're not yeah. too low. Um, but if the liver enzymes are normal. It means this is probably a, a good dose or a very good dose for this person. This person, but blood levels of the metabolites are recommended. This is a really good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, get your your fifth uh, dose if it's been offered and take it. And also, um, you might want to inquire about uh, anti. What's the word I'm looking for now? Antiviral medication. People with PBC have been offered um, antiviral medication if, on the event, they took COVID. So we do get into that category. Um, it's worth finding out. Um, are, so, sorry. There, there are different antiviral me medicines on the market. And the one that's used most commonly is the Paxlovid. Mm -hmm. And if people are taking Paxlovid, they have to do a real close inspection for drug-drug interactions because it has ritonavir. And ritonavir can interact with some of your other medicines potentially and cause toxicity. Mm -hmm. So beware of Paxlovid. Talk to your pharmacist about drug drug Absolutely. interactions. Absolutely. I think um, pharmacists and physiotherapists are two of the most underused disciplines. Um, so pharmacists, uh, they're fantastic. So it is worth talking uh, to them about. And it can interfere with blood pressure medication as well. So it's, it's something to, to bear in mind. Um, okay, so my hepatology started me on 500 milligrams of burst, so daily in March, and apart from a bit of nausea, I'm fine. Now I've moved up to 1,000 daily and have indigestion a lot, which is something I never suffered from. I'm also getting an odd ache on my right side, so don't know if this is my exercising. Maybe it's something changer again, maybe it's there. So I'm fed up with all of this. I felt perfectly okay before having my biopsy. Uh, and then they go on to say, can you suffer from indigestion while on earth? So. All right. So this is common, common meaning about three out of 100 people have gastrointestinal intolerance to urso. And there's a couple of ways to deal with this. If there are 500 milligram tablets, you take one in the morning, one in the evening. You can ask for 250s. It becomes inconvenient. But some people say, well, I'm going to take 250 four times a day. And you may not tolerate the full 1,000. You may only tolerate 500 or 750. So you need to have a good quality of life. We have other medicines that can be added to Urso to bring the alkaline phosphatase under 115. That's the target. And in uh, the EU, uh, Great Britain area, bezafibrate is an option as well as OCA, obeta-colic acid. So focus on a good quality of life. It may be half dose or so and time to add a second line or third line therapy. The ache on the right side, I've seen that happen and maybe one out of 100 people who get a liver biopsy, they have pain for weeks or months after the biopsy. What's your experience, Colette? Do people describe pain after a biopsy to you? They have to do sometimes as long as uh, up to six months. Now, I've had PPC as you know, many years, 20 years. I've never been biopsied, and I'm going to say to everybody out there, um, some doctors are a wee bit handy uh, with their biopsies. Always ask why, why you're being biopsied. It's not necessary for most people for diagnosis, so do question these things. But I do hear... Uh, people have pain, nausea, and right shoulder pain too. But I would go on to say that maybe it's the urso that you've been given. There are other types. There's many people that make them. So I don't know. The, the most common, the one that's licensed is Falk, F-A-L-K. Now, a pharmacist once explained to me, these um, urso, the, the, the ingredients are basically the same, but the coating can be different. On some of these capsules, it could well be there's a reaction to what is putting your capsules. So I think Bob is absolutely right. You know, try and split them up a bit, but maybe try a different a different type of or so. Ask your doctor if you can um, prescribe 
one of the others, one of the other genetics or, or folk. Great idea. Totally agree. Yeah. And can you suffer from indigestion while on earth? So I think, I'm not a doctor, but I do hear an awful lot of people with PBC, you know, on um, a meprazole and having indigestion. I don't know if it's a PBC, but I know a lot of people with PBC do seem to suffer from indigestion. But I don't know if it's there, so it's worth, you know, it's, it's worth, as, as Bob was saying, um, just doing a wee bit more work on this and see what, but if you try a different one or divide it up or take a bit less or ask for the second line. Strange enough, I, I was speaking with Intercept yesterday, Intercept produce um, OCA second line medication, which is licensed in this country and it has been for five years now. And only 38% um, of people are in, in UK are offered second line treatment. So folks out there, you had it here first, ask. Do not be afraid to ask what else is available for you. Um, there are second line medications, as Bob says, as beta fibrates as well. Um, so please ask. Uh, somebody says, I have a bad reaction to Ursula Norm. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're probably okay in Ursula Falk. Yeah. There you go. This goes, proves my point. Okay, now I don't think I'm going to be able to pronounce this next one. I'm on my mysophenolate mofetil. Perfect. <laughs> ah, and I've had a bad acid upset stomach. It did not start at the beginning of the treatment, but it's come on slow, slowly. I've also had bad constipation on the combination of verso and this, and budesonide. Currently, I'm suffering swollen, bloated abdomen, constipation, nausea, headache, no appetite. I can't really eat. Only very soft things, but everything causes nausea. I have AIH and PBC overlap. Poof thing. I bring my consultant secretary every day for three days and still need struggles, but I will keep trying. I have blood on the 14th of May as far as I know they were okay or would somebody have contacted me? Is there any help advice you can give in my situation? Before we go any further, can I just say to people, don't bother phoning. Don't bother phoning anybody. There's no point. Email or write a letter and keep a copy. And if you don't receive a response from your email, email again. And if there's nothing within a week or two, then go to the chief executive of that particular hospital and make a complaint. But phoning, people don't take phones. It's easy to say, oh, I didn't take the call. I knew nothing about it. People are far more accountable when things are in writing. But however, this this person is really not feeling very well at all, Bob. So this is a very important question. And I am a wonderful fan of mycophenolate mofetil, which we abbreviate MMF, just to make it easy. And that mycophenolate mofetil is a very strong immunosuppressant that was designed for organ transplant patients originally, but now being used for a variety of autoimmune disorders. It's very useful, but it also has toxicity like any medicine that manipulates the immune system. My answer to the mycophenolate is to get a blood level and have the blood level drawn before the morning dose. And that blood level should be between one and three. If it's over three, there's going to be a much higher chance of toxicity, stomach toxicity, uh, bone marrow, including suppression of white cells and red cells. So the blood level is very important. Not many providers know or use these blood levels, but I will give you a huge data set, uh, at least information on a data set that I saw that showed that this was very valuable. And I've been using blood levels for over a decade in my practice and nobody's been toxic on mycophenolate since I started using them. The another issue with MMF is, is that it that does irritate the lining of the stomach. And I'm gonna say maybe 20% of people need to be on a proton pump inhibitor, a PPI, right. like yeah. Prilosec, and there's a many different forms. Amepazole well, is quite common in the UK. Got it. So that would be another option to ask for. Uh, budesonide is a steroid that can also upset the stomach. Yeah. I use budesonide for less than 12 weeks. All my patients are tapered down and off budesonide as I get a therapeutic mycophenolate level, watching enzymes, watching function. Also, urso, we want dose correctly at 
12 milligrams per kilogram per day, mm -hmm. something in that range. So make sure that you're not overdosing on Urso. I had a patient recently and I have no idea how this happened. It was one of my patients. So I said, you're on 900 milligrams a day, correct? That's what was in my note. The patient said, no, I'm taking 1800 milligrams. I said, I never prescribed 1800 milligrams. Well, that's what the pharmacy gave me. Mm -hmm. um, so we immediately corrected that, but they were on twice the upper limits of Urso. Yeah. So check the dose. Check the dose. Somebody's put on the screen that they were fine with Urso Falk and Colarso, but they weren't on Urso Norm. So really proving the point that there are different varieties out there for for um, some suit, for others. Um, so, some suit. You know, everybody's different is what I'm trying to say. So I'm reading here, my glasses are all um, getting steamed up. So next question, I've taken Arsenal for 16 years, have no problems. After my second vaccination, which was AstraZeneca in May 2021, I became very sensitive to any medication, even medication that I had taken for many years. I'm also suffering from extreme anxiety, my balance is affected and I'm feeling nauseous. I wonder if Urso could be causing this. So I stopped taking it for a few days in the hope that there might be an improvement. But I've gone back on Urso, albeit now half the strength. I am 70 years old. I've lost a stone in weight over the last year, which I put down to anxiety. And my last checkup, according to my consultant, my liver was stable and he did not foresee any problems. Could the problems I'm experiencing be caused by AstraZeneca vaccine? If so, what can I do about it? Very complicated question with no set answer, but working through a evaluation to your consultant or your primary care provider to look for inflammatory problems that might have come from the vaccine. You can get a general test like a sed rate ESR or a C-reactive protein CRP to see if there's some systemic ongoing inflammation that might require an anti-inflammatory medication Urso is unlikely to be causing or interacting here, but as you already heard from our previous discussion, this person could consider switching to a different Urso product. Anybody who's lost weight, <clears throat> that's a flag to be evaluated for systemic diseases like thyroid, uh, work up for celiac sprue with a blood panel. Yeah. I would definitely go down each of those roads. If liver was stable, I want to make sure it's not just stable, but normal. Uh, stable can mean bad. If you have high enzymes and they're stable, that's a bad sign. So I really want to hear the alkaline phosphatase is under 115. The GGT is less than 35. And I do want to advocate strongly that everybody with PBC be getting a GGT with their liver panel. That's one of the four uh, cornerstones of liver enzymes. Yeah. And the GGT can help differentiate other confounding problems, other problems that might go alongside PVC. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. Yeah. I, I do think this person, I'm really sorry you're suffering this, whoever this is, but I do think you should go back to your general practitioner, to your GP. I'm in particular mentioned this weight loss. I know you can lose weight with anxiety, but you just want to get that checked. And as Bob says, you know, um, there's something called a yellow card, I think, that if you feel you've had um, side effects from any vaccines, you can fill in a yellow card for your GP. But you need to talk to your GP. And as Bob says, you need some tests run as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm really lost here. How much does a stone weigh? A stone's 14 pounds. It's quite a bit. Okay. It is quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I've lost four of them. <laughs> Okay, so I'm newly diagnosed and being prescribed Glenmark Urso, 250 milligrams to, to be taken twice daily. I have a phobia of diarrhea, seriously, she's, this person says, and I'm worried about taking Urso as I've heard it can cause bowel problems. I would like to know the side effects before I start taking Urso as I drive a fair distance for work, visiting old people, and I'm worried that I may not be able to do my job if I react to Urso. Well, this actually overlaps with the previous case where the person was talking about getting constipation from Urso. So Urso can disrupt the bowels in both directions. And I think the best thing to do here is to take your uh, first doses on the weekend when you have a low schedule and yeah. see what the reaction is. 
you can start with 250 once and mm -hmm. for one weekend if everything's good you go a week on 250 once a day the next weekend you go to 250 twice a day this is a very low dose <clears throat> 500 milligrams so if this person is small that's probably okay mm -hmm. but check your kilos your it should be on 12 milligrams per kilogram per day so mm -hmm. you can do some quick math somebody's 60 kilos they're going to probably be on 800 or 900 milligrams of um, or so or, or so equivalent mm -hmm. and what i tell my patients is one percent chance of hair loss one percent chance of uh, really you know significant nausea or diarrhea and one percent chance of itching that's already present but could be worse or it could be new if somebody's not itching i use that three percent rule and that mm -hmm. seems to hold up pretty well what number would you give people, Colette, to say what's the percent of people who have really significant side effects with her? Very, very, very low. I don't know what percentage, but very, very low indeed. Very low. But I'm a wee bit concerned about the comment. That there's something called Health Unlocked that um, quite a lot of people put comments on. And some of these comments are not always helpful. And I'm just getting the impression here that you've maybe been on this website and you know, you've picked up that other people seem to be having bowel problems with her. So you don't know why they have bowel problems. You don't know anything about them. You don't know what other medications they're on, their lifestyles, you know nothing about them whatsoever. Um, and so I, I would urge you to do as Bob says, try it every weekend when you're not going anywhere, doing very much, having a house day, a couple of house days, and then try a bit. But go and live your life according to other people's. Uh, what's happening in their lives, you know, to, to try it out yourself. And then that way you'll know. And I do understand having a phobia like that. I absolutely do. I would say something else to you. Having a high fat fat diet seems to affect people's PPC and their bills as well. So I would uh, recommend minimum fat, but to keep the good fat, you know, the, the olive oils um, uh, in your diet, maybe a few nuts and things, but watch it on the butter and, you know, and, and as I say, processed food, it's absolutely loaded in things that your body doesn't need. And the bowels will react, they will respond, they want it out, you know. So that's my that's my tuppence worth for that. Great advice. Thank you. Um, so I suffer, this is an interesting one, uh, Bob. I suffer very much with fatigue and aching muscles. I exercise regularly and average about 9,000 steps per day. I suffer from hot flushes and burning, throbbing feet. Are the above, the above symptoms normal for PVC? First of all, can I say to you, well done you keeping up your section, steps and your exercise because I do most days and I 10,000 is my, my minimum. But being on the phone, I can walk up and down, even being on the phone. I'm, I'm well done, um, well done you. But this, the burning, throbbing feet and hot flushes, Bob, I think the, the fatigue <clears throat> we know is a key part of PBC and how it presents and how PBC actually affects the brain. Mm -hmm. The achy muscles definitely want to talk to your GP or consultant to make sure you don't have a muscle inflammatory condition that might be autoimmune. And the best way to work that up is to check a CK level. I would be interested to know if this person's on a cholesterol lowering medicine, such as one of the statins. The statins can cause muscle aches. And of course you want to be either taken off or changed to one that doesn't cause muscle symptoms. So I think those are very, very important ideas. The hot flushes, we don't know if this is a man or a woman. So if it's a, a woman, it would definitely be time to evaluate for uh, menopausal, perimenopausal hormonal changes. Those can take place earlier in patients with PBC, maybe uh, earlier onset of menopause. If it's a man, I'm going to say make sure thyroid workup is done. Um, and if there are any GI complaints, there are some other condition that could cause hot flashes that are related to gastrointestinal uh, conditions. And finally, the burning, throbbing feet. This goes back to the neuropathy that we talked about with the other patient. There may be some nerve inflammation or nerve damage. You can check a B12 and folate level. They're very, very simple, very inexpensive to start. I do advise all my patients to be on a multivitamin. Do you yeah. see that useful, Colette? Yes, yes, I absolutely do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good diet, but, it, you know, Professor Newberger, David Jones have all said the same thing. 
and it scoops things up. And remember, we're in the northern hem hemisphere as well, so we lack a bit of vitamin D because we don't have a huge amount of sunlight, particularly where I am up in Scotland. Um, so yeah, a good uh, multivitamin. Now, we've covered this, but I'm going to read this one out. I have PPC. I've tested positive, positive for COVID for two days ago, and I have symptoms. I'm really, really sorry, and I hope you have a quick and speedy recovery. Please confirm if a person who suffers from PPC should qualify as a high risk for antiviral drugs under the NHS. The answer is yes, to my knowledge. But you have to have um, you have to take them within five days. So I would contact your GP. Your GP will put you in touch with the infectious diseases pharmacist at your local hospital, and they'll talk you through um, what the possibilities are. Um, but I had COVID in March. Um, my neighbours gave it to my, my husband was ill first, and my husband is a very, very, very fit man um, who would thinks nothing of cycling 60, 70 miles. And he was very, very unwell, and I took it three days later, and I really wouldn't have known I had it. <laughs> so don't automatically think that having PBC will make you very, very ill. I was a bit tired, but hey, you know, I'm old and, and I over-exercise sometimes. But so if, if you're keeping quite well with COVID and if you're not too unwell, which I hope you're not, because lots of people aren't, then maybe you won't uh, need the antivirals. But speak to your GP. Um, it's Thursday today. Maybe see if you can phone this afternoon um, because you only have five days. Do you want to add anything to that, Bob? Yes, yeah, ex excellent advice. I fully support each of the components, the whole and the whole package. I'm a big old fan in life, then, shall I? <laughs> right. I would like to know if I uh, if I have PPC as not diagnosed. Ah, right. Okay, as having difficulty securing a diagnosis despite the following test results. Okay, tested AMA positive, ANA antinucleic antibody weak positive, anti smooth muscle positive TETA one. 0.40, CMVIGT positive. I also have dry eyes and my eyes are itching all over and on and off pain in the upper right quadrant. No mention of ALP, Bob. And you said the anti-mitochondrial antibody was positive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, this person very likely has elevated liver enzymes because that's what led to the blood test. So we're going to assume the LFOS is high. There's no need for a biopsy in this patient in general because you make the PBC diagnosis off the AMA and elevated alkaline phosphatase, and then that avoids a biopsy. But if the AST or ALT is over 100, a biopsy would be useful to evaluate for this autoimmune overlap syndrome, which we've talked about today. So a biopsy would be considered in that setting. I've also discussed biopsies. When I have a patient that's overweight or obese, I've done a fiber scan. I've looked in to see if there's fat in the liver. And there, if there's a significant amount of fat and there's something called a CAP score, C-A-P score, yeah. that a CAP score is over 280. I often do a biopsy to figure out, is it PVC, is it fatty liver or both? Uh, and try to figure out the components because the biopsy then gives a lot of leverage for weight loss programs, especially if there's significant damage from fat liver. Mm -hmm. I think this person really needs to, you need to find out where alkaline phosphatase is uh, for sure. You say you have dry eyes and mice and you're itching all over and the upper right quadrant pain. Lots and lots of people with uh, PPC get the upper right quadrant pain and nobody really can give an explanation. Your liver's not hurting, your liver can't hurt. It has a membrane around it which holds all the nerves and things. But the dry eyes and mice, now I, I'm, I need to, to think about this. Um, try and keep your eyes wet, keep them, keep, you, you have two sets of tears. One is when you cry or you're out in the wind. The second set is every time you blink, the tear coming down and cleaning your eye. And with PBC, we do have dry eye syndrome, sickle syndrome or Sjogren's syndrome. And it's really important for eye health to keep your eyes as moist as possible. And there's lots of good things on the market these days. There never used to be. And most, or go for an oil-based um, eye drop. And if it's really troubling you, your GP will give you something, prescribe you something which you can put in your eyes overnight. Um, your mouth, ask your dentist to help you out with, with lubricating your mouth. You can choose sugar-free um, chewing gum. 
that do not, under any circumstances, buy chemical mouthwashes um, from uh, the pharmacy and use them because they destroy a lot of good things in your mouth. They can be quite addictive and they also change your taste. They are not recommended by dentists. So please don't do that. But I, I think this person should get a bit more information, Bob, to, to get a definite diagnosis. I think we need to find out with the ALP and then come back to us and we can talk some more. And Colette, do you advise every person who has or potentially has PVC to see a consultant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, they might not want to see you once a year. That's fine, you know. Um, but yeah, they should be seen by a, a specialist. I have another question. How often are you recommending to your PVC patients that uh, you know follow you through the foundation to get a DEXA scan? Right. So there's guidelines in the NHS um, in this country. So the guidelines post-menopause, I think, are five years unless there's osteoporosis in your family and they'll do it more frequent. And also, I've said to people, I was under the misapprehension that, you know, your bones are the way you are and this, what you ate as a child helped, you know, strengthen your bones and there was nothing much you could do to change things when you were older. And that's absolutely wrong. Your diet is really important for your bones. You need to calcium. You know, I, I'm not big on milk and things, but I try and take some yogurt. Bread has calcium in it. Look online what foods have calcium. You need to keep your calcium topped up. For your bones, you need weight-bearing exercise. Swimming won't do it. Um, but the DEX scan, I think it's every five years, Bob, in this country. And when I'm checking vitamin D3 levels on all of my patients, yeah. and my target's 40 to 50. So I supplement people to get them above 40. What target do you tell your patients that work with you? I, I, we haven't got a target. We, 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 nobody's ever mentioned numbers in that regard. We just leave it to, uh, to the GPs to sort of or the consultant. But that's quite helpful for you to know, actually. Uh, for that's, you to, that, that's helpful to know. That comes from a paper from the Mayo Clinic in the mid-1990s where they looked across hundreds of thousands of people and looked at different outcomes, health outcomes, cancer, inflammation, um, bone issues, bone health. And they found that this 40 to 50 was the sweet spot for the lowest risk. You don't want to go higher than that because high doses of vitamin D can mess up calcium metabolism the other way, okay. bone health. But 30, sorry, 40 to 50 is what I target. So people should discuss that. Okay, right. I will bring that to the attention. I'll speak to Dave Jones about that. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm 10 years post-transplant with recurrent PBC, and I've been back in Orso for seven years now. I was on prednisone for six months due to elevated enzymes, which stabilized. So went off prednisone a month ago, a month and a half ago, and levels were good. But two weeks ago, they took me off Orso. Also because IBS getting worse as of yesterday, ALP is the one saying ALP 274, ALT is 60, AST 63. So I started taking her so again. Was also given amitriptyline, 10 milligrams of chronic pain. Is it safe for me to start that now with my levels being that high? I think going back on Urso is a reasonable thing to do. It, Urso can affect the bowels. We've had a good discussion about um, intestinal complaints from Urso, so it could make IBS worse. There are new medicines for IBS, depending on whether it's diarrhea dominant or constipation dominant that can be used also. But the other idea here is to think about second or third line therapy. Stop the Urso if it's a problem and go on OCA. OCA has less gastrointestinal complaints, in my opinion, than urso but it can also happen it's, it's related uh, in terms of its bile salt structure and also bezafibrate can be effective alone for pbc and that could be a, um, a single agent to be used so there's some major negotiations to talk with uh the consultant mm -hmm. about this this case mm -hmm. what do you think yeah absolutely and i i, I they say predna, predna, so prednisone that's not a British way of saying you say they were prednisone so I don't know where this person comes from 
but certainly you need to be speaking with your liver specialist. You know, you you you're going to be attached to a uh, some big unit if you've had a transplant, and they've and they've also picked up that you've got recurrent PBC. So you need to uh, talk this through absolutely about the options because there are options. I want to make a comment too is that there are some transplant centers and more surgeons than hepatologists who just see oh the enzymes went up I'm going to throw some drugs at the enzymes without a biopsy. I think biopsy especially in the setting of possible rejection or PBC recurrence or both or fatty liver or something else really a liver biopsy is the standard of care to evaluate before putting somebody on prednisone or changing medication. So I hope this person's had a liver biopsy. If they haven't, they need to be discussing that with their consultant. Mm -hmm. So prednisone, would you agree that's probably this person's American then, would you say using that term? Right. That, yeah. Prednisone versus prednisolone in GB. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking, can I ask, is there a difference between the film-coated MMF and normal-coated MMF? That's a great question. There is an additional drug that's similar to mycophenolate that comes in a lower dose that has also a film coating on it. I'm blanking on the name just for a second, but uh, the film coating probably has less GI upset. Uh, and if there's a switch from the regular to film coding, it would go back to the story about checking levels to make sure that the person's absorbing the sufficient amount to have the immune suppression effect without being toxic. Great question. Mm -hmm. Just on the screen here, Celia is asking, just out of curiosity, my low platelet levels became normal after two Pfizer vaccinations. Why? <laughs> Good luck. I don't know, it's like a positive side effect, but maybe a final wrap up comment about the this vaccine. These vaccines have been used in hundreds of millions of people. The benefit of the vaccine far outweighs any theoretical risk. There's still an anti-vaccine community in the United States. And I think giving up vaccines is like giving up the toilet in your house or wheels on your car. Uh, this is a foundation of society, of healthcare. And the people who've done research on coronavirus, the companies that have developed the vaccines have done a fantastic job getting us safe vaccines. There is no perfectly safe anything. Um, there are vaccine side effects that we know about, but we've had so many people, millions and millions of people die from uh, coronavirus and the chance of dying from the vaccine or having permanent long-term effects is minuscule. I can't even give a number it's so low. So get vaccinated, wear a mask and you're in tight conditions and avoid getting COVID because long COVID, not just the chance of dying from coronavirus, but long COVID can be seen in up to one out of four people. Whereas a long-term side effect from the vaccine might be seen in one in a thousand people. So vaccines are part of helping you and helping society. That's right. We've got the anti-vaxxers over here as well. I was quite shocked. Um, I think at the first lockdown, um, when we opened up, there was a rally in London and there was a particular doctor there with a microphone. Now, I know he lives in the States. He is British. He was struck off. He was struck off because he um, informed parents that the MMR vaccine would harm their children, cause autism. And um, he was struck off for his research was seen to be, well, I won't say the words in case I get sued. But uh, he was, I was staggered to see that he had a microphone talking about the anti-vax. But I would say that, you know, the, one of the best things that's ever happened as well in the last 100, 150 years is clean water and vaccines. When we were in school, we were given smallpox, you know, all these um, injections for polio for horrible things, tuberculosis, you know, we would go to school and you'd say, where's little Johnny? Oh, he's got it. And then you might not see him again. Or he might appear a year later in calipers. You know, the things they used to put on children's legs. You know, these are all serious illnesses. And the vaccines, yeah. Yeah, I know if you get an opportunity, then, then go for it. And I'm delighted for you that uh, your, your levels have gone up. So this is a very good question now. Could you please explain the importance of the Gamma GT? What does it signify? I get mine done every six months and it's jumped to over a thousand. 
Oh, a GGT over a thousand is a flag that there's something very serious going on in the liver, specifically in the biliary system. The GGT comes from both bile cells and liver cells, but it's it's definitely a marker of biliary disease, these bile ducts, these bile tubes. The GGT is more specific uh, for liver disease than the alkaline phosphatase, because alkaline phosphatase can come from many other parts of the body, uh, intestines, placenta, uh, pancreas, um, and it also is increased if people are vitamin D deficient. So if there's lots of bone turnover, alkaline phosphatase level will be high and that's not liver related. So the GGT is a partner and alkphos and GGT typically move together. If I see a very high GGT out of proportion to alkaline phosphatase, I'm gonna take a very good alcohol history. You might even do a blood test to see how much alcohol exposure the patient has. It's a blood test called PETH, P-E-T-H. Also in somebody with uh, PBC, the GGT is going up, they're on medicine. I'm going to either get a really good ultrasound or move to an MRCP to look for some type of biliary disease. There's overlaps with PBC with other types of biliary disorders, even including an overlap with a PSC-like condition. Yeah. So this is a big flag. Get to your consultant, get it figured out. Is it also possible that this could be weight gain as well? GDT can be high in fatty liver, but not in the thousand range. Right, it's okay. usually something okay. either obstructive or I've seen it from alcohol. And a lot of people say, I don't drink much. And then they say, I don't drink more than my doctor. So I'm not drinking much. <laughs> uh, but in people with liver disease, alcohol, even small doses can be very problematic. So we really like our liver patients to be alcohol free unless they've negotiated something with their providers. Okay. Next question. Thank you, Bob. I'm in the process of going to Papworth regarding intestinal disease that may or not be sarcoidosis. Have you um, experience of lung disease with PBC? Uh, I'm on nurse so and phenofibrate. I was fairly fit, cycling each day, but last month I really struggled to do any exercise. Uh, movement is medicine. And well done you. Try to keep going with your exercise. Don't give up. Well done you. But I'll hand this over to you, Bob. So lung disease in PBC associated with PBC is real. It's rare, but this is an autoimmune disorder that can attack any place in the body. And there are lung conditions that are autoimmune. Also, there's one that's different. There's different types of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so a lung consultant, pulmonary function tests, oxygen tests, maybe a blood gas, arterial blood gas. This definitely requires a full workup. It might even require a bronchoscopy. Also, people who have PVC may be on more powerful immune suppressants and can get infections in the lung, including mycobacterium. Uh, in the United States, we worry about histoplasmosis and coxy, um, valley fever. Uh, so an infectious workup, which a lung consultant should be able to do, I think is very important. Now, I have met one or two people over the years who've had sarcoidosis in the lungs and PVC. Is, am I right in thinking that sarcoidosis can disappear, cured, gone? You know, it doesn't always stay or if I misremembered. It can be quiet and non-progressive. That mm -hmm. is a subset. And you're, you're bringing up a very important point because PVC is a granulomatous disease granulomatous bile duct destruction yeah. and sarcoid is a granulomatous disease uh, with similar types of cells that are involved and sarcoid can affect many parts of the body. Yeah. So the sarcoid workup, I believe is imperative. It's a blood test, chest X-ray, maybe a lung biopsy to get that figured out. Okay. That has come to the end of our questions, Bob, which is absolutely fantastic. You've had some great ones today, I must admit. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've got quite a few people in. Linda's sending me figures here. I'm reading off my, my phone and I've got my laptop with me on holiday. Um, but, you know, Bob, um, I first met Bob, everybody, maybe eight or nine years ago when he came to Edinburgh and he walked with me with, with my dog, with five miles. My dog's very old and doesn't walk much now, but she's still with us. But, Bob, you've been so supportive of the foundation. You've been very supportive 
to me as chief exec and a PPC patient, and you've been absolutely wonderful to the, to our members. And on behalf of everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. But from a personal point of view, I hope I see you in London next week, Bob. But I'm getting a bit tearful these days saying goodbyes to people because this has been my life. And the, the PVC Foundation's success has been down to people like you buying into what it is we need and helping us and supporting us and informing us. A, an informed patient is a better patient, has a better quality of life. And I would just like to say thank you for believing in me, believing in us, and thank you for everything that you bring. And I hope you continue to bring to the foundation. When uh, Robert will be taking over, you've met Robert many, many times. I think you've even had the experience of being in his car with him, <laughs> being driven by him. So I hope that continues, Bob. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you so, so much. I uh, just want to have one tiny closing comment. Always thinking about PVC in my federal clinic two days ago in San Diego, where we take care of this large immigrant population, underserved, underinsured. Uh, I've had, I made the new diagnosis of two PVC patients in one morning. Wow. This is what we, the message is we need to look for it. And people are looking for it. Colette, with your help, Alan's help, Robert's help, your whole team. You've changed the world. Every patient I see with PBC gets pointed to your website. They are oh, wow. absolutely thrilled with the resources that are there. And um, please, uh, let's text each other in London so we can give you a hug, okay? Absolutely. Somebody say many, many thanks, Dr. Gish and Colette. All the best for your future. You've made my life so much better. Huge gratitude. You know, I, I don't know if, I, have you read my front page of the Bear Facts, Bob? I, I read it. Yes, it's great. It's uh, I suffered alone and I could not have that on my conscience. What I know, you'll know, we'll share together. Let's try and meet up in London. Alan, everybody, Linda in the background. Yeah. There's so many people involved in this and sending me all the questions and things. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thanks very much to you both. As I said, Dr. Gish for joining us so early, your time, and Colette for taking time out your holiday. And what I can share with you is that Dr. Gish will be back with us, I'm not sure what date, but one day in August, I think it is. <laughs> I think okay. it's near the end of August. So I look forward thank to seeing you again then. So another brilliant session. Thank you both so much. No, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.